Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and we made it. Episode 525, and the finale. Finally, like, it's been, I was trying to do Eddie Brock week and cover all these things, and uh, it turned out to be Eddie Brock month, <laughs> right? Uh, I think it's been about three weeks since we started this, where I was going through the last graphic novel. They, re uh, I guess it's a collection, really, not really a graphic novel, but it has most of Larry Hama's Venom run um, in this book called Venom Tooth and Claw, and you can find it out there. It's in print now as of recording this episode, uh, but you can find all these miniseries, you know, that we talked about throughout this whole Eddie Brock, you know, three-week extravaganza. Um, you can find them all, you know, on digital, on Comixology as well, in case that Tooth and Claw book isn't in print anymore. And it's been ups and downs. I mean, you know, I gotta say, like, there's been a couple like Venom on Trial that I really liked, but then like some information came out after that I should have known before recording it about Venom actually killing somebody in Amazing Spider-Man 300, where he actually suffocated a police officer to death. Uh, and then they, so they're referencing that, but then they kind of just blow it away. There's like, eh, who cares if he actually killed the guy? And I'm like, but oh, what? Like, what's going on? Like, wouldn't Daredevil know? So that kind of throws that whole story into flux. Um, and that was the one story by Larry Hama that I really did like. Because <laughs> uh, there was other, I mean, look, I think there was The Hunger, but I can't remember if Hama did that one. But if he did, that was the best one, I, I feel. Um, but The Hunted and a couple of these other ones, I think he did Hunted for sure. Um, they're all just really wacky and crazy ideas. Like, it's clear that at some point, you know, he worked with whatever editor was, uh, you know, doing the Venom books at that time. I don't, I can't remember if it was Brevoort or what, because Brevoort was doing a lot of other things like Doctor Strange and some of the Midnight Sun stuff, I think, and uh, and like the Carnage Mind Bomb and It's a Wonderful Life. So I don't know, you know, if he was involved with this one, but uh, whoever the editors were on this, they, you know, probably came, talked to Larry Hama, said, hey, let's like wrap up this Venom stuff. It, you know, the sales are kind of dropping. Let's see what we can do. And maybe that was the thing was like, hey, sales are dropping. Let's just have fun with it. Like we're going to probably end it at some point anyway. And to me, I feel like, well, if sales are dropping, that should make you want to try harder to get the sales up and, and tell interesting stories and not just kind of throw darts at a dartboard or spin a wheel and say, okay, in this story, Venom's going to be like James Bond. And in this story, uh, Venom's going to be, you know, an FBI agent or, you know, whatever. And it's going to be like a cop story. And then, all right, in this, you know, this one, he's going to be in court, you know, whatever. Um, that's how it feels like Larry Hama handled this. And so, now that we're getting to the finale here, I mean, we just finished, uh, what was it, uh, Venom Agenda, and that was a big one-shot uh, waste of time, really. I mean, thankfully, Tom Lyle drew it, so I'm glad the book, book exists because Tom Lyle's art is amazing, rest in peace, and uh, it's nice to have a big, nice 40 whatever page um, book that that was full of his amazing artwork. So that's definitely something to where I, I feel like you could take out all the dialogue and you probably should and just flip through the pages and just watch this, you know, Venom versus Spider-Man fight because it, I feel like story-wise it adds nothing. And it sets something up at the end of it, which is like Venom has amnesia and, you know, or Eddie has amnesia. And I guess, which is weird, because I'm like, well, wouldn't the symbiote still remember? But we also run into that problem when we talk about uh, One More Day, like when, you know, Peter and Mary Jane make the deal with Mephisto. I guess it, because I'm like, how would Mephisto's magic affect the symbiote? Because the penance there doesn't even affect uh, you know, the symbiote. So again, I mean, that's just fanboy stuff, really. It's just, it's nitpicky stuff, but it it, are, it is questions that I do ask sometimes. It doesn't affect my enjoyment of things, um, but it doesn't have to because there's enough in Larry Hama's run to make me not enjoy it at all anyway. I'm actually going to go out on a limb here and say, Larry Hama, you are, I think you're my least favorite Venom writer um, of all the Venom comics that we've talked about. Now, have there been some bad ones, uh, probably worse than some of your stories? Yeah, I would say so, um, that maybe don't have the structure, you know, some, certain structure points or whatever um, that yours do. I would say tech, on a technical level and, and, and framing of a story level, there's probably a couple that are worse than yours. But luckily, those were only like three issues or two issues, right? They were only, they weren't ongoing. And you kind of wrote this ongoing thing. And it's a shame because I love Larry's work on like G.I. Joe and Wolverine and stuff like that. And, and some of his other work that he's done. He's a fantastic writer. I just feel like he had no idea what to do with Venom or he was just doing what he was asked to do, which I'm thinking was just a bunch of people sitting in a room spinning a wheel uh, <laughs> to figure out what to do with Venom. And then they just were like, all right, I landed on this one. All right, we're going to do where he's going to go underwater and fight a, a terrorist underwater now. It's like, it's, that's what it seemed like. It just, that's where the ideas seem to come from. It's just like this wheel, uh, you know, this a wheel of, uh, of misfortune or something. So I don't know. So, uh, you know, I got to say, you know, Larry, you're a talented writer. You're probably never going to watch this, but you're a talented writer, dude, but I, I can, I do not like this Venom stuff at all. I don't at all. It's so bad. And this finale story is awful. The one thing it does in it, which was 
blew my mind. You probably saw it in my edit, uh, you know, back when I did uh, one of the previous stories, like the Dr. Yes story or whatever, um, License to Kill. Uh, they put a bomb in Eddie's chest, and I thought that was going to come back into the story and have and you, and Eddie, like, you know, use the symbiote to, like, cut the bomb out. And, and I'm not kidding. I've never read Finale before like a week and a half ago or two weeks ago, whenever, um, that, that was the first time I've ever read finale. And so when I'm, <laughs> when I'm, uh, when I was reading license to kill, I'm like, Oh, that'd be a cool thing. Take the bomb, you know, have the symbiote almost kill Eddie by, by extracting the bomb, put it on the bad guy and blow up the bad guy or something like at the end. That'd be awesome. And it's like almost like a sacrificial moment, but then the suit saves Eddie and, you know, heals his chest or something. Um, that would have been cool. I think that would have been a neat thing. They actually do do that in this, to give Larry Hama credit. He brings that back. He didn't forget about the bomb in Eddie's chest. And he had Eddie, um, you know, he's trapped at the beginning. And it's all those uh, government stooges that have been kind of uh, using him to, to do things. They capture Eddie, you know, and they bring him to their facility. And they're like, all right, we don't need him anymore. He's too much of a wild card. After what happened with Jameson, blah, blah. And it's like, after what happened with Jameson, that wasn't even Eddie's fault. Uh, Smith was not clear on what to do <laughs> with that. Like I said, that book was a whole misunderstanding. Like Smith went to Eddie and says, we need you to take care of J. John Jameson. You get what I'm saying, right? Wink. You know, it's like, what is Eddie supposed to think? Like, so especially when he's been sent to kill bad people before this. So it, it's just, it was, it's so terrible, the writing. So, uh, so in this one, they're like, well, he, you know, he's unpredictable and, you know, you know, he, he clearly can't take an order and it's like, Smith screwed that up and if and that would have been cool if they made that part of the story where Smith is like ha huh, finally I'm gonna get this alien piece of garbage off our planet by lying to them and saying he you know like maybe that was something Smith did to manipulate Eddie because he knew Eddie was gonna fall for that and go kill somebody without having to say it but that wasn't that's not the reason he did it so it's like yeah just wow it's so bad uh so finale is I can sum this story up really quickly so Eddie starts off he's captured by his government stooges he uh, he does the symbiote does uh, give him an open heart you know surgery takes the bomb out puts it on the wall because Eddie can't escape from where he is and uh, he puts it on the wall and then detonates it and it explodes and that's his escape he runs out into the city he finds Trish Tilby shows up our favorite uh, reporter who just pops up randomly in some of these Larry Hama stories and some other Marvel stuff I think at the time and um, he, he goes over sees Trish Tilby and he just says on tv he grabs her microphone and goes i have a story to tell and she's like well you're you know you're a terrorist and you're this he's like no he goes uh, i'm a good person my name's eddie brock and you know and i've been taken by the government and uh, they they bailed me out of a court case and he just goes he just exposition city he just tells you everything that's happened uh but he does it in like one page so it's not like it's you know like a donny kate script where that would have taken like seven pages of two people sitting down in a chair talking to each other for no reason um so at least it did happen in like one or two pages it was really quick so Eddie just kind of tells this whole story and, and gets the truth out there. The government people are like, no, the, oh, crap, he just outed us, you know, whatever. Uh, so, like, we got to, it's too late to silence him, but we should still, you know, take him down and beat him. So they go after him, and then Spider-Man sees this on TV, uh, watching TV with Mary Jane, and uh, and then, he, you know, he sees it, and he's like, all right, I got to go stop Venom. And Mary Jane's like, okay, be safe. And then pretty much like most writers, uh, you know, they don't do anything with Mary Jane, uh, or if they do, it's, it's, it's pointless, you know? So she just sits on the couch this whole time just watching the TV, seeing everything unfold, and you're just like, it's it's like, if you can't figure out what to do with characters, don't put them in your story. It's like... It, it's so aggravating so it's just but you're just wasting page count really um so anyway so spider-man goes into the battle and it's pretty much just three issues of spider-man and venom fighting venom doesn't remember who spider-man is they fight on land then venom escapes into the sewer spider-man follows him down there they fight down there then they come back up on land at the end and spider-man uh hits eddie again and eddie like it hits him really hard in the head and I think it jogs Eddie's memory so now Eddie and the suit both remember that Peter Parker Spider-Man uh so so the amnesia thing it happened just in the issue right before this right before finale a month before finale started uh there was the venom agenda a one shot where venom gets amnesia and then literally appears nowhere else in the Marvel universe with amnesia to make that story matter at all and then he's now in the finale and he has amnesia for like an issue and a half before his memory comes back and he remembers who Spider-Man is. Uh, and then he, that's it. And then they fight at the end and then Venom, uh, Spider-Man teams up with Agent Smith and some of the, the goons, you know, the government goons. And they use a, a sound blast thing on Eddie and they ended up, uh, they end up 
hitting Eddie so hard with it that it uh, seemingly destroys the symbiote for good. Uh, they pump him with dopamine blockers and they separate Eddie from the suit. And then Eddie uh, is standing there saying, screaming like, I am alone, <laughs> which is an image I put on Twitter and uh, Instagram not too long ago. And people were like, hey, I know what book that is. Um, so uh, yeah, and that was the day I, I finished reading the book. And I was just like, oh my God, this is so bad. Uh, so so anyway, he has a, he, you know, Eddie's like, you know, stand there and the suit poured off him and it's just dead in the street now. And then they pick up Eddie and they're like, all right, we're going to take you away. And then that's pretty much it. That's what happens in the book. It's Venom the finale. And it's like this, it's, I mean, I'm glad it's a finale that it was like Spider-Man and Venom fighting. Um, but there's no, there was no thematic thing tying back. Like if you remember Venom and Spider-Man came up with a, a kind of a half truce, right? They were like, Hey, you know, Venom's like, I'll leave your city. And then you and you know and and uh, you know thanks for sa saving and weighing. I'm gonna leave. I'll go back to San Francisco, and you'll never see me again. Of course, Eddie did come back because he had planned the symbiotes, and, and then he decided to stick around after that. Um, but they didn't really like. And then he fought the Scarlet Spider and all these. So he had all these adventures and stuff. But you could have tied that back in, like you know, like in the dialogue, you know, Spider-Man being like, you know, I really wanted to believe in you. I wanted to believe you would go on and do better things. And you could have Eddie plea with him, please, for the for freaking once peter understand that i wasn't the bad guy here i'm trying to do the right thing like you could have had some real like kind of interesting emotion there between the two characters and uh you know and that's where i got to give donnie kate some credit i know i slammed sl him a little bit earlier but donnie is pretty good with that relationship between uh, you know eddie and peter and you could have had some of that here and and, and made it more heartbreaking because maybe spider-man like says like i want to believe you eddie i really do but I think it's just smarter to just defeat you at this point and take you in. Um, I think you could have done something there that would have made the impact of the ending feel. You feel like actually feel something because I don't. I was reading this. Uh, Mark Pajarillo is the artist of this book. He does a pretty good job. I've never heard of Mark before. I don't think he might have come in and done a couple things for Marvel around this time in the 90s. So I don't remember his name too, too well. Uh, but he he did a pretty good job on the art. The battle scenes were really great. But that's the only compliment I can give this book. It's 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 bad. Like the, the Venom finale has got to be one of the, especially when you tie it with Venom agenda and you kind of consider that the last like hoorah for Venom in the nineties. No wonder Marvel like kind of lost interest in him and got rid of him because after this they went in a totally different direction with Spider-Man. They had like Norman Osborn come back as you know the major threat uh, after the Clone Saga, and then he was doing this thing called the Gathering of Five, where they reveal Aunt May's still alive and stuff, and it kind of wrapped up the Clone Saga threads, like with the Scryers and everything. And then they rebooted it with uh, John Byrne and, and Howard Mackey came in, and that's when we get the next Venom arc where he shows up and eats the, the Carnage symbiote off of you know Cletus Cassidy. So you know, we, but we go a couple years without seeing Venom. I think like maybe two or three years. And it, it was probably much deserved. And then even when he came in and ate Cletus, that stuff was okay-ish. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it, it was still like, to me, Venom didn't really truly come back um, until they did like that, um, that Daniel Way run where they took like a clone sliver of it, you know, up in Antarctica. And they kind of went in a new direction with Venom. And I think that's why they didn't want to involve Eddie at first in that series and why that series was probably originally planned to go longer and not bring Eddie in for a lot longer. But because sales dropped, they were like, all right, we got to wrap this up. We got to bring Eddie in and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, like so, I feel like Venom kind of really did just fall off the map and fall out of people's uh, favor at that time, and and so I would say the late '90s, early 2000s was kind of a you know a dull time for Venom fans because he either wasn't around or when he was used, it was it wasn't that you know very good. So uh, so yeah, I mean, so this book just it's te it's terrible, man. I, I I really can't say it in a nice way. Like I know I'm try to be Mr. Positive and I try to actually you know dig in and critique and talk for 30 minutes on something but i'm not wasting 30 minutes on this it's it's already been 15 minutes and i think that's plenty of time to talk about the the failures of this book and just talk about a few of the specifics because it really is it's just it's just toys smashing against each other and while i don't have a problem with that on some level in some ways you can make that entertaining i just felt like larry never did uh, on venom he just never really made the the action figures smashing against each other feel very entertaining it's weird because it's like i read his wolverine stuff and oh, it's not like it's deep amazing stuff and same with his gi joe stuff but they're fun and entertaining they're like fun popcorn stories and this one is like it's almost that like he's going for that but it just 
I don't know. Maybe it's because I love the character, you know, as much as I do. I mean, I love Wolverine a ton too. Uh, you guys would be surprised how much of an X Men and Wolverine fan I am. Um, I mean, I sure I talked about it before, but I mean, big time love those characters. So, uh, but I still found myself enjoying some of his Wolverine run. So this that's why I'm so like feel disconnected by this. I'm like I really don't like this. And yeah, I gotta say, I think I think his run is my least favorite and it's only because it like if yeah if you pick like a random mini series like a uh, venom sign of the boss two issues n not very good at all and it features ghost rider which is another one of my favorite characters dan catch ghost rider and i st i do not like that book but it's only two issues so the pain doesn't last long with larry he's on like six of these mini series and the venom agenda one shot that's too much <laughs> to not eventually hit a stride and that's what I that's why I feel like this is not very good stuff. So you guys let me know what is your least favorite Venom story out of all the ones that uh, have come out. Let me know down in the comments, not to be negative, but I'm just curious, you know, tell me your best and your least favorite Venom story. I would love to hear that down in the comments below so we can continue our conversation down there. And I do have some great stuff coming up for you guys. Um, a lot of you out there who were scream at me saying, you know, Venom 2, let there be carnage. It has to be rated R. It has to be rated R. And I'm always like, no, it doesn't. You know, 95% of Carnage's appearances have been in PG-13 stories. Uh, but there is that 5%. There's Ven uh, Carnage Mind Bomb by Warren Ellis um, and then uh, and Kyle Holtz. And then there's also, um, you have Carnage, uh, It's a Wonderful Life by David Quinn and, uh, and Kyle Holtz. So the cool thing was, is that David Quinn was nice enough to uh, reach out to me and talk to me a little bit uh, behind the scenes, you know, like on Instagram and stuff and messages. And we kind of developed a friendship and he was like, hey, I, I like what you're doing on the show and I'd love to come on and talk to you about, uh, you know, about my book on Carnage, about the, the mature rated Carnage book, one of two mature rated Carnage books. And he was like, I'd love to come on and talk to you about that, talk to you a little bit about some of the characters I've written, you know, over the years in indie comics like Faust and, and stuff and Lady Death and then Doctor Strange, you know, and then also my Carnage book. So I said, of course, man. And I knew you guys would probably really love that. So the next two episodes, I broke it up into two interviews uh, or two halves, I guess. Um, so those two will start going up uh, right when you're seeing this. It should, this should go up either fourth of like fourth of july or that or like early that morning fourth of july hopefully um if not july 3rd i'm trying to get it up as fast as i can but um you'll see the david quinn stuff definitely on fourth of july for, for part one and then on july 5th you'll see part two of that interview so uh yeah all of you guys out there who love carnage and love the mature rated carnage uh you're gonna love that interview i recorded it with him a couple days ago and he is just the nicest guy and he's got a great perspective on character um you know on story creating, pacing, uh, like paying attention to continuity, doing his research for continuity, and uh, and also like what his kind of view on Carnage is. Uh, and it's such a great conversation. I think you guys are going to love it. So make sure you stay subscribed so you don't miss out. And as always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you guys in those episodes coming up very soon. Peace.